So we were all set to um, pretty much break ground on that. And then we brought in the third partner, who was a physician. In the 11th hour, he went, he tried to steal it from us. Part of the heartbreak was an identity break. My identity was with this for 20 something years. And so when that project died, it's like my identity died. For most men, when you take away the cultural associations constraints and you say, look, just be yourself, be authentic, maybe be vulnerable. Most guys do that. And all it takes is one guy to take that risk, to be a little vulnerable. Today's episode is all about men, about masculinity, about men supporting men. Our guest today is Owen Marcus, co-founder of Everyman, an organization that helps men live fuller and more connected lives. Owen is a serial entrepreneur who was going through a difficult time and wanted to discuss with other men how they experience things. It felt safer, yet he couldn't find anybody to talk to. So he created his first men's group 17 years ago, trying to take care of himself, really. His experience since will resonate with many of us. The business was growing, he was building something great, and yet he found himself burned out, triggered by the betrayal by one of his business partners, along with a Lyme disease diagnosis. We discuss questions around identity. Is entrepreneurship a calling? And how do we show up authentically when as men we are not being taught to be emotional? It's easy to talk about emotions in the context of business, but how do we create space for vulnerability? Everyman's work is focusing on men supporting and teaching other men, using the body and the physical experience to get through, finding ways that men understand for the healing to start. Owen calls it assertive vulnerability. Today, at 68, and having been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and dyslexia since, Owen feels healthier than ever. He continues using his men's group as his main support, but nature, good sleep, Exercise and diet are important factors in his overall well-being. Please meet Owen. This is Naked by the Future Farm, where entrepreneurship is stripped to its vulnerable core. Brought to you by Vladi Meshkobrestinska and Nectarios Lolios. And remember to subscribe, follow and rate Naked to help us share it with the world. Hi, Owen. It's it's great to see your face again. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. Hello, Hi, Nectarius. Hi, Vladi. Uh, Owen, we have this tradition. We go around the table and we sort of locate ourselves. And today I want to sort of extend that also to check in with you on your energies. I know it's an early morning for you, so I already gave it away a little bit. <laughs> so, yes, I'm in uh, Northern California, Pacific time. So, uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning, but I'm a guy that gets up early. So uh, uh, you got me fresh. I feel good. And this is often something that we do with our men, which is like a check-in. So my body feels good. Um, my back is is getting looser and looser. My back was tight for a while. Uh, my butt doesn't hurt from sitting in the chair for 12 hours. <laughs> and so I feel comfortable. And I am uh, really excited to uh, connect with the two of you and your audience. You just brought it to a completely different level, you know, I, but I remembered this and thank you uh, from our training. And I'll talk about that in New York, when we did the check-in and you immediately went towards the body, like, how does the body feel? Like, I, I do remember with my team in Pakistan, we do those check-ins, but now you just made me reflect because we usually go towards the, you know, still staying in the mind. So I'll do Nectaris, are you up for it? Let's do this. I mean, let's oh. let's you know complete the circle. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just go. yeah, I, I see. So um I you know, I feel body feels a little excited. I feel some tension in my hands and 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 legs, but um in my last therapy, my therapist sort of we are working thematically to today's topic. We're working on the feminine divine energy. 
Mm -hmm. Woohoo. And uh, she told me that, you know, in terms of the posture, she said, like, before you go into anything like, let's say, recording or a stage, just sit with your legs sort of open a little bit. So don't close your legs and ground your feminine energy. So I, I did that before <laughs> today because I knew there's going to be a lot of energy here. So, yeah. And I'm in Slovakia. So that that's me. I feel we should all follow Owen's lead and every time we do this, we should give an update on the status of our butts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in London. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very good because I had a very cerebral, intense day uh, with lots of deep thinking and I was sort of rushed from the last meeting into this and uh, I just needed to take a moment, but bloody what you just said, I, I always do this, especially when we record our podcast episodes or when I have... Um, something I think I need to be more focused where I ground myself. Literally, I need to feel the soil. Mm. So I always, and that makes me feel more upright. And it's kind of funny because the moment I know it happens, it's already my body's used to recognizing that signal that goes time to calm down. Uh, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling calm. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We're also getting back into the habit of recording because we had a break between the two, the, the, the last season and this one. And it's nice. It's a language that between Bloody and I, and I guess we sort of started developing. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. And I'm in London. I'm at home. But uh, next week I'll be in Greece, which also fills me with quite a bit of joy. Yeah. Exciting for this. But so, Owen, before we deep dive, I think, you know, there's so much to unpack with you. Um, I like to sort of set a little bit of context for for the, for our friends, for the listeners. So um, it's, 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 it's a special moment in a way, particularly for me. I'm going to speak for myself to have every man and to have you on the show. Um, we've been sort of following the work of every man for a few years, really. Um, for, for you guys who don't know um, and folks out there, we introduce everyman in, in the intro, but still, I mean, the, the key premise is what you guys call emotional uh, and mental fitness, leadership and health for men. Um, and I think that's sort of the key uh, guiding topic for today with you. Um, you and I, we've met in New York. I can't really recall the year. I'm really terrible at this, but certainly about two, three years back um, at the training of every man for, it was an open group. It was interesting. In our, it was, there were men and women learning to sort of guide men's group. Um, and, and I remember you very sort of vividly from that, from the training from a full day and, um, as uh, somebody whose your energy was very radiant and it also allowed people to open up about things that we usually keep very, very close to our soul, heart and body. Um, so sort of very excited to go into those places. But the one thing I realized, Owen, as I was also preparing for today is that somehow I know quite a lot about every man but I don't know, or we don't know much about your own story. And, and, you know, there are so many identities that one can see when just Googling. Okay. So this is the sort of a social media space and LinkedIn spaces goes from you're a serial and serial entrepreneur. So every man is not your only venture that you co-founded. There is a, uh, your author of a book, you are a trainer or, or you are a coach there's a lot out there. I'm, I'm sure I haven't sort of named all of it. Um, the, the question I would like, like to start today is actually about your own emotional and mental health as, as Owen and as men. I don't know much about that. Like, how did that whole thing let you to what you do today, who you are today? Can you share a little bit more personal with us? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Actually, that's that was a catalyst to what, who I am as a person or a, or a man, but certainly also a catalyst to every man. So over 40 years ago, um, I was after college, I was traveling and ended up in uh, Boulder, Colorado, which was sort of like uh, a mini Berkeley at the time. In other words, a very liberal, progressive community, uh, a huge Buddhist community there, a lot of holistic health uh, there, a lot of future 
somatic psychotherapy started in Boulder, Colorado. And I was living with a group of guys. I had one guy that moved out from Florida. He was an attorney, given up his law practice to become a rolfer. And a rolfer is a particular kind of somatic body therapy where we're structurally realigning the body by getting rid of chronic stress, which has a, a physical component, but a, a, a huge emotional component. And so he convinced me to try. I did my traditional 10 sessions of rolfing, and it literally changed my life. Uh, it was like two years of therapy every week, good therapy. I mean, it changed me physically. I grew an inch, lost 20 pounds of tension. But more than that, I learned how to relax. And that was how I lost all that tension, was my body relaxed. And, and physically relaxing, I emotionally opened up. So I spent four years in Boulder learning to be a rolfer, learning uh, the beginning of psychosomatic therapy by from people that were literally starting that whole profession. Uh, I was sort of in the right place at the right time. And then in the course of those 40 some years, I realized that um, I had, I was dyslexic. So I worked on healing a lot of that. I realized I had Asperger's syndrome, which is, you know, what mild autism, worked on healing a lot of that. And then um, yeah, I ended up in um, Phoenix or Scottsdale, Arizona, ended up starting a uh, integrative or holistic medical clinic and employed doctors, rolfers, and many other people. And and did that for several years and literally got burnt out on that and then ended up moving. But in the course of doing all that, I also uh, really learned how to integrate the, the body into releasing emotional stress and tension. And one of the businesses I started in this one was with, with another partner was really the first uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction company in the country. It was uh, using John Kabat-Zinn's approach. And we had a, a large company, you know, working with people throughout the Phoenix area where we got referrals from doctors and hospitals. We got all the super tight, A, stressed out CEOs, physicians, doc, um, attorneys that, that, you know, were doing all the right stuff, but they were getting tenser and tenser. And because of that, we're having all these medical conditions. Mm. So that was the beginning of applying everything I'd learned to, you know, how do we downregulate the nervous system so that not only are our physical bodies working better, but so is our emotional body and our relationships. And then right at the end of my stint in Phoenix, I realized that, you know, I worked with or healed a lot of my physical conditions and my relationships still weren't good, particularly my relationships with women. And they weren't bad, but they weren't satisfying. And I thought, well, maybe if I work with men, I'd learn something. And I go, well, I don't want to work with men. And I go, well, maybe that's a sign that I should. So I started my first men's group uh, in my clinic. Uh, I think it was 1995. And it was mediocre, but there was something about it that it intrigued me. Ended up moving to Northern California for a year. I helped start one here. Um, and it was great. And that was an inspiration. Ended up moving to North Idaho for uh, like 23 years. And in the course of that, I started a new kind of men's group. So I took everything I'd learned from all my training, all my clinical experience of working with people individually in groups, corporate training, business, all that, and my men's work training and said, all right, I'm going to create a new model that really first works for me. And I would hope for other men. I asked 11 men. They all said yes. And we started the Sandpoint Men's Group 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that ended up being the, the beta tester for every man. And so in the course of those 17 years, we developed a lot of processes, techniques, um, skills, and a whole new frame for how to work with men. And, and it was really grounded in what we were talking about. Using the body as a vehicle to help men connect to their emotions and from there with other people. And one of the things I've learned in my practice was that you ask most guys, what do you feel? Like, what do you feel emotionally? And they either roll their eyes or look for the door to get out of the room, where mm -hmm. if you ask them what they feel in their body, they'll usually answer you. And through connecting men to their bodies, they naturally get connected to their emotions. And once they get connected to their emotions, they actually start to downregulate or feel safer. And that sets them up to connect to others. And so that's it's essentially the core of what we do with every man. And I've been doing for a few decades with men. Yeah. 
And I have to go back on the journey because it sounds, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, you've said this like a hundred thousand times, like, and it all made sense, but oh, and you, it, 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 there was such a simplification for my ears by saying, oh, I had, you know, I, my relationship with women was not necessarily as I wanted. And hence, I, I didn't want to work with men, but I said, maybe I should. So I started a men's group. Is that how it all starts? Like it's, it, I, it doesn't seem natural to me, just naturally for somebody to come in and it's a big decision to work with men only, right? Like, can you share a little bit more? What was well, going I, on yeah, for you? I, I started a men's group really selfishly for myself that, you know, maybe I could learn something. And what I didn't know consciously, but maybe unconsciously was, and I've seen it now with thousands of guys, is that when we're in an emotionally safe space, most men, given a simple protocol, uh, will start to feel safe where they can start to connect to themselves. And by connecting to themselves and their own experience, they start to connect to the other men in that room. And through that, we learn the skills that we did not get to learn growing up in this Western culture, where we learn literally to be disconnected from our bodies and our emotional experience and really other people. So uh, it's it's hard for us maybe cognitively to understand how men, you know, as men, we are so disconnected. How can we be more connected when we're just with a group of guys? But what happens is even though we, most men in this culture have been trained by women on how to be emotionally connected or how to be emotional because that's how the culture has been set up really since the industrial revolution because guys were at work and women were raising us and our teachers were women and our nurses or therapists have been women so we've just accepted men and women that that more feminine model is a model that works for men but what happens inevitably when you put a group of guys together and they feel safe and it's just guys, they get to screw up. They get to learn from other men and they get to sort of go back in their maturation and their emotional learning and see and experience and play with and experiment with how to be emotional in an emotionally safe way. So once, once they start to learn it, because I believe it's really intrinsic in us. And so it was sort of unlearned from us, but once we start to learn or relearn, these simple skills, because they're intrinsic, they naturally generalize into the rest of our relationships. But the secret is that men learn a lot quicker, I think probably better and a lot more sustainably when they learn with other men. Hmm. Nick Towers, I have just one loss. And I, you know, I know that you, you're going to go there. Oh, and did it help you for your uh, on your own journey? Like when you started the men's group, I want to come back to you. Like, how was that experience for you? Well, it really helped me. And I again, I did not know this. One, because at that point, when I started the men's group, I didn't know I'd had Asperger's. Uh, mm. So it was actually after I got into all that, that I realized that. But specifically, what it helped me was that, as a lot of us know, with Asperger's, one of the key symptoms is we have a hard time emotionally con connecting really with ourselves, but it shows up with other people. So all those thousands and thousands of hours of sitting with men, I got to learn and practice in a safe place, mm -hmm. how to connect with myself and with others emotionally and find my own unique way of doing it, where now it's become natural, where without all that, I never would have been able to develop that skill set. Mm. Yeah, it's it's quite new to us, Owen, to have actually a conversation about gender in the context of what we're talking about and gender related behaviors. So it's really interesting to see how you articulate your experience. But also one of the things we want in our conversation is also get to the point about how specific behaviors that are attributed to men's behaviors um are impacting the mental health journey of an entrepreneur and if you overlay this with the majority of people who start a business are, are typically male so that gives us hopefully an insight right um, but it's also kind of fascinating to see that in our conversation with you the two will flow in and out of each other right because your entrepreneurial journey is is clearly very closely linked to your own mental health journey and you just you said this in a side comment quite dismissively. You started this clinic, it was a big thing, and then you burned out in the process. Hmm. Um, 
can we stay with that for a bit? Sure. <laughs> what does this mean? How would you, how did you experience burning out in the process of building something that was meant to be meaningful, impactful, helping other people, doing something good for the world? And in parallel, you realize that maybe I'm not doing something good for myself. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I burnt out in several ways. I mean, it was somewhat facetious because I was living in Phoenix and I got tired of the heat. <laughs> but in a more emotional way, um, I got I got burnt out in one way because I was working with all these um, healthcare professionals, you know, physicians, rolfers, and everything in between. And most of them thought they knew something about business, but didn't. And it was more like, they were sort of emotionally immature in some ways, and that was stressful. Uh, specifically, I had a partner, and we were building a very large, uh, state-of-the-art, new uh, holistic medical center called the Scottsdale Institute for Health and Medicine. Uh, Andrew Weil uh, was going to be our medical director, and he's a, you know a big, he has been for decades, like the, one of the top holistic docs in the world. Um, he started a program down in the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, we had the largest hospital in Phoenix lined up. Uh, the mayor of Scottsdale wanted us to double the size of it. Um, so it was going to be 10,000 square feet. Uh, Taliesin, which was the Frank Lloyd Wright School, which happened to be uh, in Scottsdale also, were, were architects. So we were all set to um, pretty much break ground on that. And then we brought in the third partner. He was a physician. In the 11th hour, he went. he tried to steal it from us. Now, he couldn't. But rather than fight the process, I said to my partner, you know, uh, I'm not going to do that because, you know, in litigation, the only ones that really win are the attorneys. So we just walked away from that uh, and started another business, which is that mindfulness business. Uh, so that was part of the burnout um, with the whole field of working in, in healthcare, you know, in a clinical way. And... Walking away from a business that was grand in ambition and grand in potential impact, uh, that you kind of dedicated your life to it. Uh, how close was that experience to questioning your own worth, identity, place in the well, world? I mean, I was, I was sad. Maybe, you know, you might say depressed, uh, physically sort of burnt out. Uh, what I also realized later on was that I had Lyme disease and had it since I was in my late teens. So I'd go through fe you know, periods of just like chronic fatigue from that. And later on, I ended up healing that. But at that point, that was part of it. So I was physically burnt out, too. But you're right. I mean, for a good 20 years, I've devoted my whole life to you know, serving people and had at one point the largest rolfing practice in the country and then wanted to do more. I mean, part of it was, you could say ego, but just that sort of maybe masculine thing. All right. I needed another challenge. And so mm -hmm. I kept on creating new challenges, which was exciting and succeeding. And then building this clinic was a huge challenge because it was something that no one had ever done uh, using a model that I'd sort of evolved over the years and no one had ever done on this level. And we were getting acceptance, acceptance by the traditional medical community. So that was a huge coup. So to be betrayed by one of your partners was, um, yeah, was devastating. And, yeah, and yeah, we were on the verge of making a lot of money, but it was more that, you know, it was a culmination of a few decades of, of a dream that I didn't realize it was a dream when I started out. Um, and within two years, you know, I ended up leaving Phoenix after that because that was sort of the real end of my experience with Phoenix. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. It was a, no, bloody, I've got, um, yeah, no I, 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 when I was listening to you because I had a, not a similar experience, but something that is comparable to some extent. And the word I finally found when I realized what had happened to me I didn't use the word devastating, devastated. I used the word heartbroken because for me, there was something about that thing that I've never experienced in my romantic life where it hurts, where it literally hurts because everything that you've invested in stopped, stopped existing. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I think that Vladi wants to go, come in. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a moment. Vladi, yours. 
staying still however in the same space we usually get to this much later in the conversation but i'm curious owen um what at, at that point in time on your journey like what were your support mechanisms like maybe some of that that you mentioned you moved places it sort of felt like that was a leaving something behind and maybe there was some healing element to it what else was there for you well you guys are asking really good questions um that mm-hmm. was one of the reasons i left phoenix because i really did not have a strong support system and mm-hmm. i came from the northeast i was born in vermont so i i sort of grew up in the environment of small towns and then the support the, of a small community uh moved to um in, uh, excuse me uh, northern california in part to be with a woman i was dating who was a, an english woman who had been living in california and, uh and that relationship ended within 13 months and and, and i went there with a understanding that we wouldn't stay that we'd move someplace into a smaller town and i looked at going to back to vermont ended up moving to north idaho which in some ways was very similar very small rural community of sandpoint idaho uh in in the beautiful mountains on a beautiful lake and it just had that feeling of a small community and i also moved there with a with a group of people that were going to start it's sort of a, a smaller kind of community well that ended in several years but that was a drive to to really have a support system and to just add to what i was saying earlier part of the heartbreak was you know an identity break and a, you know and as you inferred my identity was with this for 20 something years and so when that project died it's like my identity died now i fully didn't realize or realize the impact of it in the moment But my, you know, it's like I went through what Joseph Campbell would have called that, you know, hero's journey and that sort of dark night of the soul where, yeah, I had to let go of, or it was being taken away from me, but, you know, I had to let go of not only my projects, but my identity and what that identity meant to me and really find another one. And now I didn't have a plan to find another one. It, It sort of found me. I mean, I did the men's group in the beginning as a one-off, as mm-hmm. you know, a, for a selfish thing. And in the course of being in Sandpoint, Idaho, it, it just sort of came to me and one thing led to another. So when I started my new group, I again I did it for myself. I had no vision of evolving to being what it was, where they did a documentary film on us and where we've had over well over 300 men in this small group group of now several groups in a small town of 8,000 people. And so all that was just me sort of trying to take care of myself. Mm. You know, in the words of Parker Palmer, uh, he he calls this a calling. That what what's came to my mind when you sort of started describing your work with men. And um, is it a calling for you, what you're doing right now? Yeah, it really is. And it's actually more of a calling than my rolfing, which I did for just over 40 years and, and being in the holistic health field. And that, you know, I started out in my early 20s, and really fortunate because most young men don't have a calling that early. Uh, but I was really inspired and driven, which was a lot of what made me successful. I really got a lot out of helping people. Uh, and in the beginning, i really didn't know what I was doing, but I had the passion, which kept me going. And this calling has all the benefits of my first calling and more. And part of the more is the maturity. And also this time, to get back to your other question about support, I'm not doing it alone, which which for the most part has been a lot better uh, deal than it was the first time. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about men now? <laughs> um, so when Vladi talked me about told me about every man, this was by, by the way, I think Vladi, you were in New York in in autumn in the fall of 2019, because it was just after we started talking about the future fund. You know better. And I I remember feeling slightly, I wouldn't say unsettled, but there was an unease about a bunch of men coming into the room because this was all at the same time where we all became a lot more aware of me too and everything else. And I was trying to make sense of this, right? And I'm pretty sure you're used to navigating all the conversations around around toxic masculinity and everything else. But for me, 
having grown up, never having been an alpha, having always been the chubby gay kid in the corner that had was very popular with the girls. I've always been slightly intimidated by all male environments. So Vladi suggested to kind of let's look at this and doing interesting stuff. And then when when COVID hit and lockdown happened, I actually joined um, one of the groups. And I think it was also for you, one of the groups that you did remotely for the first time. And I thought I was going to be on a course, somebody would talk and then there might be a Q&A. And within like a couple of minutes, I was in a small room with three other men thinking, what the F is going on here? I was supposed to share. Um, but it was unbelievable how quickly we went from not knowing each other to being raw, vulnerable, open with each other. And I'm pretty sure some of the people that I ended up talking to, I would have never chosen to speak to in real life. So what is it about the magic that you create that you get people to this point? What is it that unites and allows this vulnerability? I think when we take away all the constraints, the associations of this culture, and just let men be men, you know, as you said, guys just show up. And that was, we were even surprised because we started these, what were the global calls and community calls that we still do. And guys would come on and they didn't know anyone. Now some of the guys know each other and they're used to doing it and we still get new guys coming on. But inevitably guys would come on off of that little breakout group and share like, wow, I don't know these guys. I never would have chose these guys, but I connected to them in the course of a few minutes more than I've connected to any man. And so when, when you, for most men, when you take away the cultural associations constraints and you say, look, just be yourself, be authentic, maybe be vulnerable. Here's a question to focus your conversation around. Most guys do that, do that. And all it takes is one guy to take that risk to be a little vulnerable and maybe it's our competitive nature that we have inherently in men. It's like, well, I'm not going to be outdone with that guy. I'm going to be more vulnerable. Uh, or, you know, you know, it's like, we like to be challenged as guys. So in, in a very supportive, loving and connecting way, what happens often is when guys feel safe and then and all the cultural expectations are left at the door, guys will pretty much naturally do, do what you described. They'll just be real. As a woman on this call, a lot of the things that I've been hearing till now, I could equally apply to women, you know, from my own experience. So help me understand and unpack a little bit. What is the special, what are the special traits for men to come together to make that special. And, and Nectar is using your words like the magic, right? For men to connect. And I think there's even more that I'm curious about the challenges that men face that I might not be even aware of as a woman. To start with that, I think most men, and I was one of them, we're not aware of it. Because like I said earlier, we're all swimming in this water and we're so used to it, we don't even realize we're swimming in it. And I think that in a more global sense, what that is, is that um, we've grown up in a culture that, well, let's just back up. So we all started out in tribes. And then tribes, you know, the community raises the kids. Uh, and and how gender shows up is completely ha different than how it shows up now. And then, you know, when farming occurred, you know, men were still around, but they were around a little less, but they were basically there in the community and at home. But once the industrial revolution started, men had to go to work and often for long hours and all the men were gone. So women were relegated to taking care of everyone. They showed up. And so with the start of that, we just gradually developed a emotional model that was more associated to, you know, how women are emotional. And we don't we don't think about that, and we've just accepted it, and it's not bad. To the, you know, now ninety percent of the therapists trained, at least in this country, are women. And so, and I've spoken to you know therapy organizations, and they don't disagree with me. It's just that they don't think about the impact of that collective model on men, and men don't think about it either. And so, when we 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 extricate men from that general model. Uh, what happens is men get to sort of discover their own model through their own interaction. And so we learn, particularly emotionally, we learn through experience. 
We don't learn didactically. We don't learn through books. We learn through experience. But the prerequisite to learning emotional skills through experience is you got to feel emotionally safe. Now, there's a fellow named Stephen Porges, who's a scientist who's really studied all this through the vagal nerve, which is that 10th cranial nerve. And what he's realized is that we are hardwired for social connection, but we don't have social connection unless we feel safe. So men don't realize they're not feeling emotionally safe. So we get a lot of referrals from therapists. My partner, Dahlia, is a family therapist, and she'll, she's trying to send virtually every man she has uh, in her huge practice to us because that expedites her couple's therapy. Mm. Uh, and, and what she sees, and more and more men and women therapists are seeing, is men haven't been taught how to be emotional. And again, being emotional for men in particular really has to have a, a somatic or body connection. And so one of the unique things for men around emotionality is the somatic connection. So you think about it, and this is sort of common sense. We are much more physical. We are the warriors. We, we are the hunters traditionally. And so we're very physical. We like challenge. One of the ways that boys grow is through challenge. And, and so in a, in a traditional relationship, the mother is sort of saying to the child, and maybe particularly the boy, don't do that. That's dangerous. Don't do that. That's dangerous. Now the father says, go do that. You know, come on, I'll support you. You know, you know, I'll catch you if you fall, but you need to take risks. And so in a lot of situations, we find that men haven't really been encouraged or allowed to take, take risks, particularly in an emotional context. So that struts, struts, what's the word, uh, re represses their emotional growth because, again, particularly with men, we learn through experience and experimenting and failure. We learn that, you know, all right, and, and this gets back to, you know, being an entrepreneur. I think one of the things, because I've loved entrepreneurs, they're always my best clients, is that we learn to take risks. And we also learn that, you know, if we fail, there's a good chance we're going to catch it before it's a big failure. And if we, you know, fail or fall down or whatever, we can get ourselves back up. And so it's men need to learn that model in, in the emotional arena, but we, we have a very hard time learning that when women are around. Can we stay with the entrepreneurs for a bit? Mm. Because as you were talking, I was thinking, and this is clearly simplifying, but does this mean that if we talk about mental health for entrepreneurs, that we should also apply a slightly different lens about the potential challenges that a male entrepreneur would face than a female entrepreneur from your experience? How, how would you, how do we gauge that? Um, I think the biggest challenge is what you touched on earlier, so support. Men tend not to have that emotional support. Now, women inherently do, and I can talk more about that kind of support, but generally men don't have that support. So men have different support organizations like uh, Young Entrepreneurs, uh, EO, which is, you know, Emotional Entrepreneurs, which you know I've done some training for. Uh, and they want, you know, they, you know, when you ask these men, why do you belong to these organizations? You more often than not, particularly if they're aware, they're going to say for the emotional support. Yes, I get business support and this and that, but it's really that emotional support I need. And, and when and it feels safe or culturally accepted when it's put into the context of a business organization. So it's less and less, but still, for a lot of guys, it's a little hard to go, all right, <clears throat> I'm going to go directly for the emotional support. And that's essentially what they're doing when they come to every man saying that, you know, I need a support, I need a training, or I need a fix, I need a lot, you know, I'm just lost. And, you know, this sort of makes sense. And these guys, don't seem too woo woo or too cultish or whatever. They're, you know, they're laying it out in a simple way that makes sense to me. And like a good entrepreneur, you know, they do their due diligence, you know, they use their mind, they use their experience, they use their gut, you know, does it feel right? And they go, like, I'm gonna give it a try. And if it if it doesn't feel safe, it does, if it's not working, I've just lost a little time, maybe a little money. And that. I think taking that entrepreneur perspective that we use for business and applying it to our, the emotional arena is really what makes these men successful. And that's one reason that 
so many of my pri- private clients, a lot of the men and every man are entrepreneurs because they're they're willing to be emotional risk takers. Um, Nectarius, yes. I, I was thinking, so, so our mission with the Future Farm goes beyond raising awareness for mental health entrepreneurs. What we want to do is change the way people look at entrepreneurship and the way people deal with entrepreneurship, go into entrepreneurship, et cetera. And, and based on our conversation, I kind of feel that we've been missing a trick a little bit in the way we look at why somebody starts a business. Not necessarily just going into the what happens when they get into business and they face the roller coaster. Because you talked a lot about risk at the beginning uh, when you talked about the men's groups. Um, and we never really dug deep into what triggers somebody, male or female, to think about, oh, I, nobody else does it. I need to start. I need to do this myself. I'm going to take this leap. I'm going to take a risk and then leading it from there. And I think it would be an interesting conversation or an interesting path to go down on. Uh, and maybe not in this conversation, maybe this is just a reflection on actually trying to understand the motivations of why women start a business and how they then approach it based on some of the markers that, that we've been discussing and how it, it looks for, for a male audience. For us, one of the things we've seen is that we've found enough men to be able to be, be comfortable to talk to us about the challenges they faced, the struggles that they faced whilst building a business. Uh, but we never really dug a little bit deeper into the what gets you to that point in the first place? Mm. Uh, so you've started a few like getting business. blurred. Sorry, it's mm. just Go to ahead. react to that. Like you know, I feel like it's getting blurred these days. At least probably in my own bubble. Like I see, like in the past, I've seen more women to be more purpose driven and impact driven when it comes to entrepreneurship. And I guess men somehow being commercially driven, like there was a performance driven. But like I. And this is probably also my personal nature that I always looked for outliers. And I feel like I'm seeing a lot of them these days. And it might be my own bias, right? Uh, confirmation bias here. But like, I felt that this is blurring here. Um, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, there was part of me, Nick I'm curious how you relate to this. But there was part of me that, you know, even me as, as a woman and my identities, like I sometimes, particularly around the masculine and feminine, I sometimes feel like the pressure, like, oh, I have to get the balance right. Right. Like, oh, I'm, I'm doing too much of masculine and now I should be a little bit. It was interesting to listen to you. Like in some way it was quite liberating just to be me without yeah. attributing some of those traits and, and, and the scale. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so occasionally in our groups, we would invite women in in different capacities and they'd have the same experience. It's like, wow, they get to sort of be on the outside watching these guys be real. And that and that did everything from relax them to turn them on to to disconnect to them and have empathy for men. Um, because we as a culture and I'm sure women, we we often don't get to experience guys in the authentic way. Because we're so performance oriented and not in a normal way that we think, but also in these subtle ways of trying to do it right, trying to be the right masculine man. We get the, you know, the model of the hyper masculine guy, the macho guy, which I think now we're all realizing really not healthy for anyone, including men. But we get this hypo sort of sensitive masculine model, which we've had generations sort of develop that. And I remember when I was a young man, there was a book called Sensitive Man. It was a small book. It was written by a woman. And it was my Bible for a while. And I, I read it. I learned it. And I perfected my techniques in being sensitive. And, and what it did was it got me really connected with women. They, women loved it at first because they felt really safe with me and connected to me. But what would happen, this is what got me into men's work, was my relationships never got any further. They didn't really develop because I could, you know, on a somewhat initial or superficial level connect with women because I was nice and I was sensitive. I was safe, but I wasn't being myself and I wasn't really being a man. And it took being with other men to really first see that and then learn how to be my own man, which so I didn't get rid of my sensitivity. I actually got better at it, but I also got what I call assertive vulnerability. And uh, several years ago, I developed a test 
called the MQ test. And it was five unique skill sets that women can still have, and I think they particularly have in an entrepreneurial setting, but are more intrinsic or more critical for men. And one of the, probably the most unique one was that ability to be a vulnerable, sensitive and all that, and assertive at the same time. And so men need to have that more assertive nature. And when they find it for themselves, there's this natural balance that actually relaxes women even more. Nick Terrace, how do you feel about all of this? It's it's have? really interesting. It's so there's so many different points to draw from. Um, let's go back to the gay guy in the group of straight white men, um, because I've been that guy many very often, especially in my corporate life. And it's always been really difficult for me to explain to my straight friends, who straight male friends who'd never met a gay guy, that the things that unite us are many more than the things that actually are different. So I I look at other guys very much in the same way they look at girls, rather than being this cliche effeminate. So they would put me closer to the girl camp, and I would go, no, no, I'm in the in the boy camp, but I'm just looking at boys rather than you looking at girls. And it was a very bizarre conversation because I didn't realize that this is the way I was I was being judged. Mm. So, uh, but that uh, made it for me very relatively easy now to connect with straight guys by leveling really quickly and cutting out a lot of the BS and allowing people to be also comfortable with their sexuality. It's just a different story. So that was one trail of thought, going back to how you think about this. So for me, I'm still slightly blurred between the gender conversation, the sexuality conversation, um, the the conversation. And for me, that's one of the things that we haven't touched upon. And I don't know if this is, if also actually we realize we've spoken for already for quite a while. Um, There's the conversation we're having about the behaviors in our everyday lives, the introspection, the things we learn that we need. And there's a conversation around a system that is built and catering more towards the needs of men and towards the the demographic markers of men. Uh, I I remember the first time I read that Google Maps distances of walking are measured in men's steps, not in women's steps. And therefore, women usually take a little bit longer to get to what Google says. Uh, Or the fact that buildings... I have no idea about this. Okay, <laughs> you can you can Google it, uh, um, but also things like how buildings are built, where the toilets for men are. It, it's the simple stuff that you re- you can find quite easily, and that's the thing that troubles me more in our conversation about about masculinity, femininity, about gender, and everything else is how much of this is the conversation we're having, where you can bring in nature and bring in cultural context, and this is something you can do on an individual level. But there's a layer above which you sometimes just kind of hit these edges of a system that has is, is boxing you in and doesn't allow you to move beyond that. And that, for me, is probably one of the the questions that I have that I haven't answered. And, and Owen, I'm curious to know if this is something where you go in your work, in your public work, private work, or is, yeah, I'm curious. To, we do. I mean, it, it's... It, it's sort of implicit, and, and uh, you're, you're inferring these these walls or boxes are. We just grown up, so we're not really aware of them. We don't we don't know we're bumping up against them. But in these groups or trainings, they, it comes out, and often all it takes is one man to either speak to it directly or or react to it in some indirect way. And then many other guys will light up and go, "Yeah, me too," and you know, not just cognitively but emotionally. Uh, and, and there's that whole thing of co-regulation and, and mirror neurons. And it's like one, one, one guy has an experience that's that's uh, congruent with their mind, their emotions, their bodies are really having the experience. It's not an observational thing, but an experience. Uh, inevitably, in these safe groups, other guys have it. And then they realize that part of what they're up against is challenging these basic assumptions that no one ever really challenged before and how, you know, it's limited them. And, and then we even we want to take it even further. We get into epigenetics, which is, you know, the science is saying that our behavior and who we are is determined more by our experiences through generations than our genes. So that's the leading edge of you know genetics now. And I just was speaking to a fellow that wrote a book on that whole thing, and, and he's doing therapy, and he's going to be on one of our global calls around, you know, how you know, you get a patient 
or a client that's struggling and he's done or she's done all this other therapy, but not getting over the hump. And, you know, now they're finding out, well, maybe it's his grandfather that had this problem and he's sort of acting out that problem from a couple generations back. And you can, you know, work with it in the present and heal that, that epigenetic connection uh, for the past. And now they're doing it around a lot of race theories that mm. a lot of the, a lot of our restraints around race, it, you know, is cross uh, generational. And we got to deal with, you know, the, the collective affect of trauma. Yeah. yeah, yeah and, right. and that's what we're doing in our groups. Now we don't, we don't necessarily have that discussion because we're deal- dealing with it in the moment. But often, you you know, in the hindsight, you realize that that man who has trauma, his trauma was more than just hi- him having it. You know, I was talking about the generational trauma with my therapist last Friday. And, and I mentioned this at the beginning that we are currently working on this, like rediscovering the what she calls divine feminine energy. And, and in some way, it's a womanhood because I also on my own journey sort of, sort of suppressed it. And, 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 and she went generations back towards the history and we went through it in some way it was liberating, but it was also, it was part of anger and frustration. And I wor- sort of worked through, through it towards acceptance and stuff. And as I'm listening to both of you, right. It's interesting because I didn't know how I'm going to react on this call as a woman. And, and in some way I'm losing that identity part on this call like it's just it's interesting how it allows me to connect to both of you as just a human being and and we all sort of go through that right so um I know we are supposed to wrap up but I have one more question (laughs) I know but I I want to ask this because I saw it on my own eyes uh live again on the training the psychosomatic experience can you speak a little bit more about the power of it and why you feel that it's so important, particularly for men to do that or use that method? Yeah. Um, so in this culture, we were not trained to, you know, men in this Western culture to connect through our emotions. We're trained to connect through our mind and we get really good at that, but there's a lot of obvious downsides to that. So when you try to connect to most men emotionally, they freeze. And that's one of the, the phenomena of, you know, of survival, we fight, flight, or freeze. So when we can't fight or, or, or run, we freeze. So guys sort of freeze emotionally when, when there's an emotional performance thing that comes up. And I certainly did. Um, but when you start to connect into their body, uh, the opposite usually happens. They start to wake up. So guys, again, you know, this is a, a generalization. Uh, so I, I'm willing to say, <clears throat> mm. not defend it, but I think um, men are a little more uh, physical than women. Uh, and certainly in a cultural way, we were trained to perform uh, for, you know, a long time. It's about our bodies, you know, for everything from, you know, being their protectors of the, the tribe to, you know, the farmers to the grunt in the factory to the grunt in the, in the battlefield. You know, we've, we and our bodies have been, you know, what has you know, evolved this culture and built, built what we have along with our minds. And so men can relate to that. So what we do is we, we slow guys down. So I created what we call the rock formula, R O C. So the R is to relax and the key to relaxing is slowing down and slowing down is slowing down our mind, slowing down our body, and slowing down our physiology. Mm -hmm. And so in the sympathetic response, which is that survival response, things speed up. In the parasympathetic response, the relaxed state, the safe state, things, our breath, our heart rate, our awareness, everything slows down. So as we slow down, and we get men to slow down in some simple ways, then they're more available to connect to themselves and feel safe. And so we get them connected to their bodies. And then what we do is as they're connected to their bodies, we bring in the stress that's already in their bodies. Or really, and if it's in their bodies, it's in their mind or their emotions. And so we sort of balance, you know, the safety, the connection or relaxation with sort of what you talked about with your therapy, bringing in 
the the discomfort and and doing both at the same time. So not too much discomfort or stress where the guy checks out, disassociates, which is a survival response, a freeze response. So he can stay connected, but we can you know bring up that that previous disconnection from survival being and can, you know with PTSD, which because we've worked with a lot of vets and some truly clinical. PTSD people, but for most of us, it's a more subtle PTSD of that state of freeze and disconnection. Bring it in, bring what's the charge, the physicality of it, the physiology of it, and yeah, and the emotions of it, but not too much where the guy, again, disconnects. So bring it in, bring in more awareness. And so what happens over the course of, of an experience is this man gets to experience what he did not get to experience. Because when men or women or in anything that's physiologically like a trauma experience where they can't run or fight from, or third default is to, to immobilize, as Stephen Borges would call it, we freeze. And, and part of that is we disassociate, we disconnect. So if we're going to get eaten, we don't feel it, or we might you know feign death. So our predator doesn't think that we're going to run away, we're dead. And if he's not real hungry, he'll come back and eat us. And, you know, my story when I lived in the mountains of Idaho was one of the deers in my yard or my meadow would, would get attacked by one of the mountain lions. And if the mountain lion wasn't hungry, he'd leave. And the deer, a few minutes later, would literally shake, stand up and shake it off. And when he shook it off, he had no PTSD. But see, we never got to shake it off, literally and metaphorically. So over time, men and women for a lot of different reasons, have built up more somatic and emotional charge. And all healing is predicated on down-regulating, releasing that charge. Because, again, we can't heal, create, connect until we down-regulate that. Or to the extent that we're jacked up is the extent that we're limited in all those other ways. So to just wrap it up, our secret sauce for men is to use their bodies and their awareness of their body and their experience to downregulate this whole process. And the beauty of that is when a guy has done that a few times, he's literally retrained his nervous system. You know, we know now that a neurology is plastic. We can create new neural pathways. And so when a guy has this experience, he literally creates or recreates or re uh, channels mm. his neurology so he starts to experience and behave differently yeah now th- this is this is super powerful and interesting space and i know that both nick Tyres and i are also doing this through our own therapies and we we sort of had many conversations on the power of it um, um we, we we're curious with every every one of our guests who who has shared their journey with us, also to know what do you do now to look after yourself, both mentally, emotionally, psychologically? What are your support systems now? Uh, I still have my uh, men's group in Sandpoint. So we got several groups, and one of the groups is virtual, in part because we got a lot of expats all over uh, the country, and so we can meet through Zoom. So that's one thing I I do. Uh, Another thing that I... We want to do more of, uh, and I have to admit, I don't do as much of, is getting out in nature. Uh, mm. Science has shown it, and my own experience has shown it, that nature is probably the best healer. So literally, it grounds us. And one of my old friends, uh, he's a researcher, Jim Oshman, is the guy that sort of, he didn't, dis- made, I don't think he discovered it, but he's a scientist that talks about earthing or grounding, how literally, when you connect to the earth, uh, you get all the negative ions from you know the earth, and that really starts to downregulate, relax you, and heal you. Uh, so you know, I try to do that. Get out in nature. Um, I certainly work on getting a good night's sleep. I think that's critical. And something I've done for um, over forty years is eat a really healthy diet. You know, take different kinds of supplements. Uh, and I'm a hedonist when it comes to body work. Uh, I always find good body work in whatever community that I, I, I'm in. And I try to get some kind of body work once a week. So I'm 68. And um, I have to say that I'm healthier at 68 than I was at 18. And I wasn't, 
I, I wasn't unhealthy, but, uh, you know, having Asperger's and dyslexia, and particularly the Lyme disease, I wasn't really strong. And I now feel strong and vibrant in a way that I never had before. It's really great to hear. I mean, mm. you know, um, there are chapters in life and, 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 you know, there's never sort of late to start, right? Um, the one word that stayed with me, frankly, from this whole conversation was authenticity. Um, in some way, I just felt like at the end of the day, it's about coming back to yourself, whether you're a woman or a man. But um, thanks for, Owen, for sort of, you know, opening up this world to us in, in a, you know, much bigger scale in terms of understanding the power of men's group and, and men's emotional sort of intelligence and health. How can our listeners engage, find you, work with every man? Uh, just go to our site, everyman.com, and that second E is missing. So it's E-V-R-Y-M-A-N. Um, and we have a few free ways to experience us. The Global Call is mm. one of them that we do a few times a month. We bring on different thought leaders. Uh, we also have a membership, which is really pretty inexpensive. And once you're a member, you get to really experience the breadth of what we have to offer. So everything in some way is around a group experience. They could be small groups. They could be big groups. They could be one hour groups. They, you know, they could be you know, a weekly group like, you know, I've been in for years. Uh, so everything's through experience, particularly through uh, group experience. And a guy can go at his own pace. And we literally have men from all over the world participating on our platform, uh, in our groups. And yeah, and these men um, are really finding ways to yeah be authentic and renew themselves. And one of the things that I didn't realize in the beginning, and a lot of these guys don't realize in the beginning, is in being you know with a part of, say, every man, there's a huge benefit of men get to benefit from the ability to contribute to another man's life. And so we've never, as men on a whole, experienced being authentic, as you spoke about, and the value of that in, with other men. So when you sit with other men in a, you know, these emotionally safe ways and you're just being yourself, that is a, an immediate feedback and support for other men. And so men leave these calls or their groups feeling like, wow, I never contributed to another man's life in such a powerful way, certainly just being myself. Mm. Awesome. I'm curious if I'm going to see Nectari is doing more of this. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Owen. I think I think I can speak on both of our behalf that we, we really enjoyed the conversation. It was a very rich conversation. Really appreciate also the openness and the sharing. And yeah, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. See you very it's soon. Thank you, Owen. Join us next week to reflect and digest. You've been listening to Naked by the Future Farm, where entrepreneurship is stripped to its vulnerable core. To learn more about our work, sign up to our newsletter or visit thefuturefarm.co, where you can also apply to be a Naked guest. Naked is produced by Dan Turgill and edited by Catherine Walker. And remember, subscribe, follow and rate Naked to help share it with the world.